Good evening. Welcome to tonight's prayer and Bible study. Uh, and for tonight's lesson, uh, if you watched last week's, I'm starting a new series on Show Thyself a Man. This is uh, lesson number two. And uh, before we get into that, we're going to jump into a quick little word of prayer and a prayer meeting. That's what these are about, is to have a little bit of prayer for, uh, this is Saturday, so we've got church tomorrow. So we pray for that and the things going on. But if you're watching this not on a Saturday, it's good to pray anyway. Just pray along with me. I'm uh, going to open up with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to get into uh, the series that I'm constructing on uh, being a man and showing yourself a man. So uh, hope you all uh, enjoy it. Just pray for me as well that I say uh, have the Spirit move what I say and it not just be my opinions on things. Uh, but anyways, just follow along. I'm going to open up with a word of prayer and then we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we have once again. Lord, just uh, go online with your word and to give a little Bible study. Lord, just help me as I try to give the study, Lord, just uh, to take myself out of it and only speak as you would have me to speak, Lord, to be filled with your Spirit. Just guide me, guide my heart and my tongue, Lord. And uh, do it. I pray for our services tomorrow at church, Lord. Just uh, be with the Sunday school hour, Lord, to be with myself and the rest of the teachers, Lord, as we try to give lessons, fill us with your spirit, and uh, be with that as he's preaching. Fill him with your, his, your, with your spirit as well, Lord, and give him the message you'd have him to say and the words you'd have him to say, Lord, and do to pray for the, the children's church, Lord, be with Brother Colt and the rest of those teachers, Lord, with the kids during the church hour, Lord, just help them to guide them, guide the kids as they have them uh, to, in the way they ought to go, and Lord, be with the rest of the ministries, help them to go well. And Lord, there's a lot of sick folk in church, Lord. Just be with all of those uh, needs and uh, and those problems, Lord. Just uh, touch all of those lives and help us all to lean on you. And once again, thank you for this time that we had to put your word out. Lord, just be with me as I try to give this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week I started a series uh, called Show Thyself a Man, which is uh, based off of uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, where David gives his final uh, final. Uh, remarks to Solomon, final closing um, <coughs> closing words uh, and instructions to Solomon as he's getting ready to die and Solomon's already king at that point and he's taking over the kingdom and going forward uh, for God. And so and he tells him to show thyself a man. And I use that point, uh, if you haven't watched the series, the lesson I did last week, and go back and watch that because uh, they kind of build off each other. But I use that point to talk about what it means to show yourself a man. It's one of the problems, one of the biggest problems in America right there and today is the lack of the family. And the and in that lack of the family, the kind of headstone of that problem is there's no men stepping up to lead families. And God has a design for how to be a man. So as I said last week, this is what these lessons are focused on men and what it's like to be a man of God and and to go forward as a man, but uh, like I said, it's going to be good for women uh, or children to watch this as well, especially young uh, boys, uh, so they understand what it means to grow up and, and what it means to really be a man, even if they don't have a good influence. And I'm not saying that I'm the pristine influence or, or the the best influence even. Uh, I hope that these lessons are drawn 100% from the Word of God, and it's not what I say, but it's what God says, because I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out as well myself and how to be the man God would want me to be. But there are some things that, uh, no, I'm still relatively young in the grand scheme of life, and uh, I've not been married that long, and I've not been a father all that long either, and uh, but there's things I figured out uh, about being a man, and I figured those things out not through my own knowledge, but by following God's word and God's example. And there's things that I know that I need to work on myself, and so that's what these lessons are focused on. So last week's lesson, I kind of did a synopsis of David because that was the that was the one who said, "Show thyself a man." And so we kind of went through David uh, as we met him and and how he showed himself a man even as a young man, and uh, went through that lesson. And so today's lesson, we're rewinding all the way back up. It's in Genesis one. If you have your Bible, it's not that hard to find. Uh, but not Genesis 1, we're actually going to be, uh, yeah, it's Genesis 1. I'm getting confused already. Genesis 1, we're going to start there and then go to chapter 2. Uh, so Genesis 1, we have creation recorded for us, a synopsis of creation. Uh, God, obviously, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's how the Bible starts, and uh, and it's how it should start, in the beginning, God. And we know that God is that um, that Hebrew word Elohim, which is a, it's a uniplural word. It's a, it's really a quite an amazing word. And uh and so you get in that, and uh, the first day God created light, and the second day God divided the light and the darkness, and then the third day God uh, <coughs> uh, separated the water from the waters. He had the upper firmament and the lower lower firmament, and then the third day uh, God brought forth the earth and made uh, made vegetation uh, <coughs> to appear, and the fourth day He created uh, 
uh, the sun and the moon and and the stars were almost like an afterthought. And then uh, you get into the fifth day of creation and God uh, created uh, uh, animal life and the waters brought forth uh, moving creatures that had life that uh, <laughs> they may fly above the earth and uh, the heaven and, and he created uh, sea life. He created wells and, and creatures in the sea. And so he created birds and, and, and fish and filled the filled both the sky and the water. And then uh, the sixth day is where we're going to start reading. This is verse 24. Uh, and this we're, we're focusing on show thyself a man. So we're going to talk about the first man. And not just the first man, but also... Uh, Man in his innocent state, in God's perfect state in the garden, and how God, the original design for man, and I don't really want to say original design because God's an omniscient God. He knew where Adam would be and he would that he would fall. But God had a design for man that actually supersedes man. Uh, and uh, before before the fall, before redemption's plan was uh, was revealed to men, uh, there was a man was designed and given things, and that design still holds true today. And it's amazing how it all works together. And so that's what we're going to study. And next week we'll get into the fall of man, the decision that also has to be made on top of being a man uh, before you even start to be a man. There's a decision that has to be made, and that's my next week's lesson. But this week's lesson, we're going to talk about man and. Uh, in what we call the age of innocence, uh, Adam. Uh, so anyways, we're picking up in, in verse 24 of Genesis chapter one. It says, this is the fifth, uh, the sixth day of creation. And it's six literal days, by the way, if anybody's watched that and you wonder where I'm standing on that, it's uh, pretty clear in the Bible, the evening, in the morning, solar days. I don't know how you can get anything else out of that. I know people really read really far into that and it's just all wrong. Anyways, uh, <laughs> verse 24, and it says, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creature after, uh, living creature, the living creature after his kind, a cattle and creeping thing, a beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and every living creeping thing uh, upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So this is sixth day. Uh, so on the fifth day, uh, it's, it's easy as can be. On the, on the fifth day, God created fowl and fish, and then so the sixth day, He's now creating uh, land creatures, creeping things, and, and so. You get it lined up in your head. Day one, he created light and darkness. And then day two, he separated uh, the upper waters from the lower waters. And day three, he uh, created, uh, he brought the earth forth out of the waters. And then day four, he uh, <coughs> he, he filled the earth, uh, he filled the sky and then uh, the, the outside of earth. And then day they. Uh, Four, he, uh, five, gosh, <laughs> day, day four, he, he, he created the sun, moon, and the stars, and then day five, he created uh, uh, the fish in the sea and the fowls of the air, and then day six, he's creating the land creatures, all right? I uh, know I botched that pretty bad, uh, but you get the idea. Uh, so we're day five, and so he's created land creatures, every creeping thing that creeps uh, on on the earth, and so... Uh, so he's created that and God saw that it was good. Now God's getting ready to, to, to make his crowning jewel of his creation, the most important thing in his mind that he creates. And this is not just my opinion, right? Because uh, God says thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and the angels desire to look into the things of man. Uh, it's amazing. This is God, God's crown jewel of, of his creation is mankind. Uh, and here's why. We're going to get into verse 26 here. And God said, let us Make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, I love that uh, that word God, that uniplural. God refers to himself in uh, the plural sense. He's not trying to play some pronoun game like the like the idiots try to do today. We talked about that last week. But he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's, a, he's a triune God. He's a three-part God. That's why we're three-part beings, and we'll get into that. So, God, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We were created in the image of God. So we're talking about being a man. Really, the the when you think about uh, being a man and growing up to be a man, as I thought about being a man, one of the most amazing things that you can get worked in your head is that you created in the image of God. You're a created being. You didn't just happen by happenstance. You're created. God, God designed you. See, and, and this isn't off topic at all. These these evolutionists and, and these quote unquote scientists that think that the Bible is a joke, uh, they they really hurt the mental state of men. Uh, in, in a way that nobody really likes to talk about, right? Uh, but 
men have to, if you, if you don't think you're put here for a purpose, if you don't think you're created, then you wonder what your purpose is. And so as, as growing up as a, as, a, as a man, and even a woman, we're ta- in this particular instance, God says he, male and female created him. We're talking about man and women at, at this point. And, and we're created in the image of God, a three-part being. And we're, we're created in a beautiful, the beautiful, perfect image of God. And, and, and it's a beautiful thing. And, and people wonder why we have so much mental issues and suicide and murder and all the terrible things that happen in the earth. Not a week goes by, it seems like, where some catastrophe hasn't happened. Some kid has shot up his school or somebody's run through a crowd in a vehicle or or some awful things happen uh, because somebody is in their mental state into a point where they don't value their life nor the lives of them around them. And it's because we've stopped teaching that man is created in the image of God in a perfect, beautiful image. But we say, you don't know, it's your evolution happened and you just happened by chance, by a billion chances, happened on top of a billion chances, and that's how you got here. That's what evolution teaches, right? Is that somehow miraculously um, un, 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 inorganic matter somehow became organic matter uh, and, and then carbon-based life came out of, of nothing on its own, of its own volition. Nothing forced it to do it. It just kind of happened over the course of billions and millions of years and, and, and you're just a result of all these random instances that happened and, and so your whole life is just a random occurrence. In, in, a, in, a, in a sea of other random occurrences and you have no no design to it, no purpose, and it is your own. And that, and some people think, oh yeah, that's a wonderful thing that I'm just here off, uh, off of all these million chances. I'm a one in a million chance and, and my life is my own. But you realize that gives you no drive, no purpose, no reason. But if you're here by design, if somebody created you, and Psalms says in Psalms 130, uh, eight or nine, it says that the uh, that the my part members were written in the volume of the book, talking about God has your design, and from your conception, God has a design and has created you and designed you and and molded you, unlike He's done anything else. See, up until this point, God has brought He brought forth fowl out of the water and put put fish in the water, and He's brought forth animals out of the dirt. But now, all of a sudden, and we'll we'll get into it in chapter two, God has done something special with man. He created man in His image, and He gave him more than just a body; He gave him a, a soul. An inner man, something that drives him. Your emotions. You see, animals don't really have emotions. They don't. They don't really have thoughts like we have thoughts. I know in today's society, people treat animals like 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 human beings, but they're not. They they don't have a soul. They don't have a consciousness. If a dog mauls a child, it goes to sleep that night just like it went to sleep the night before. There's no mental damage done to it at all. If if if, a, if an animal does something horrendous, it doesn't care. Uh, they 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 have no they have no consciousness, no seed of emotion, nothing mentally that goes wrong. If their life goes wrong, they're all based off pure instinct. Now you can train some animals, you can teach some animals, but at the end of the day, they're formed out of the ground and they weren't given the special thing that man was given, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. They're just simply formed out of the ground and they'll go back there one day and and they're not eternal beings. But man is an eternal being. We're created in the in the in the image of God, we're all eternal beings. We have an eternal soul. And this isn't the focus of the lesson, but that eternal soul is going to end up in one place or another. And so like I can mention we're three-part beings. I want to elaborate on that. We're a body, a physical body that you can see. You can see me in this recording. Uh, and then I'm a soul. That's my inner man. That's my emotions. That's my thoughts. That's my consciousness. That's, that's everything that makes me who I am inside my soul. And it's everything that makes you who you are inside. It's your soul. And there's this third part that at this point, Adam, and we'll get into that. Adam was created with a, with a third part that was very much alive, his spirit. Your spirit is your God consciousness. It's, it was, it's what connects you to God and what's, it's what connects you to other believers. Now, if I'm talking and somebody's a non-believer watching this, this is going to go completely over your head. Even if you think it's not going over your head, it's going over your head. You see, your spirit is something that it dwells inside you. And, and once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and this is what I'm going to focus on with next week, let's talk about this decision, but just a brief synopsis of the gospel is your spirit's dead inside you. And when you're born, you're still born spiritually. And, and that spirit has to be quickened, and that can only be quickened by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and so uh, through faith in that, but at this point, Adam's a three-part being. He's, he's a body, he's a soul, and, and he's a spirit. And God's a three-part God. He's God the Father, and, and it's amazing, right? You have God the Father, and, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and we know who 
God uh, the Father is because of God the Word or God the Son, right? Because the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we got to experience the glory of the, the Father full of, of grace and truth. And, and so and it works similar with mankind, right? See, I have an inner soul, who I am, but the way you know who I am is through my body, the way that my, my voice goes forth. That's part of my physical body, my, my hand gestures, my, my movements, my eyes, everything that I, I, I look at, uh, things that are what make me who I am. And, and, and so that's who you get to know me is through my body, just like we get to know God through, through God the Son, God the Word, Jesus Christ. And then there's a spiritual side that you can't experience unless you're another believer, uh, that, that I can connect with other believers in ways that I can't connect with non-believers, that I can connect with God in ways that non-believers can't connect with God. And so it's a beautiful picture in how man was created. And, uh, and we're created in the image, and not even just the image, but in the express likeness of God. And, and so... That's point number one. We're creating the image of God. Point number two, and this is just the introduction. God gave, not only did God create man in his image, but he gave him dominion. Going back to the text here, in verse 26, and it says, Let us create man in our image after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creepeth on the earth. You realize that man has dominion over the earth. Another thing that's destroying men at the very basis is this climate, climate, climate activist, climate change activist, uh, these people that worship the earth. Uh, it's, it destroys man because it creates, it, it paints a picture of man being some kind of parasite. That we're not here to, to make the earth better, but we're some kind of disease that the earth has. See, that's how the world looks at mankind right now. And so uh, men of Men especially have had it, and I mentioned this last week, we've had this feminist movement where being a man has become a problem apparently in the last few years. And um, and and on top of that, we have this evolutionary movement. that So you've got a feminist movement that telling man that just being a man is a problem. And then you have the evolutionary movement that says, hey, you're here by a million chances and happenstances and 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 your life is just whatever it's just a chance it's a it's, a, it's something that just happened uh, you know, unexplicably uh, out of nothing and then on top of that on top of those two down, downward progressions you, you have these climate activists that say okay not only are you a problem because you're a man and and not only are you uh here by some weird strange happenstance but but now you're not just a problem you're the problem. You're the parasite of the earth. You're the one causing the earth to die. And so you have, it all, it's all interconnected. This problem with showing yourself a man, this is how the world has taken attack at men. And some people watching this, if you're listening to this, you might think I'm crazy. But the more you look at it, <clears throat> men are told from the time they're in school that they're a problem being a man and they have no drive or purpose in life. And not only do they not have no drive or purpose, but they also have no uh, meaning and, and they would be better off not here at all. And then, then they teach them all that, and then they wonder why there's so many kids that show up at school with a gun, or there's so many kids that have depression and anxiety problems, and, and they don't even know who they are anymore. It's because that's what the world teaches, but that's not what God teaches at all. And so when you're showing yourself a man, you have to realize, number one, you're created in the image of God. Number two, you've been given dominion over God's creation. That's also your stewardship, what you're responsible for. When you've been given dominion over something, you're now responsible for it. You see, we have to answer to God for our stewardship one day, especially as Christians, we have to answer to God for our stewardship, and God's given us dominion over the earth. And what and we've been given it, and God and we've been God gave it to us. It's all God's to begin with, but we have to answer for what we do with it. Then number three, I've already hit it. God male and female. There's only two. Male and female, two biological sexes which result in two biological genders in our language, and uh, the male and female. And then get into verse, uh, the fourth point in the opening, uh, verse 28, it says, And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree and which is <coughs> which is the fruit which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed into you, it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and every fowl of the air, and every creeping a creep, a thing that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life I have given, every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And you see, there's the, the last part of this intro, is there was command. See, we're created in the image of God, and we're given dominion over the earth, and we're created male and female, and so on the fourth that, our command is to be fruitful and multiply. 
See, God gave us a purpose, a command. He, he gave us, he, he made us wonderfully in his image, gave us the earth and said, now you have a purpose for life. And that's to be fruitful and multiply. And the world's so, so much against being fruitful, not even just uh, having children, right? The, our whole generation, even conservative and liberal, there's actually a population problem on the horizon that scientists and, and prediction and strategists are were, were, were looking at. They're like, we're not, we're not, we're not populating the earth enough to, to make up for the amount of people that die every day. And uh, see, they used to call the climate activists cry overpopulation, overpopulation. But now all of a sudden uh, we bought into that nonsense and, and, and they put every girl on, on some kind of, contraceptive and you shouldn't need that if you're living your life right right we should be waiting for that to get married and then when you get married everything's all good and your goal for marriage is to create a family but see even these kids are getting married people my age are getting married and they don't want to have kids they just want to be married and the point is is god that's not what god commanded us to do and, and you read you wonder why this generation my generation which is the millennials and then gen z after us are so empty and void and, and fruitless in their life is because they're They've been told that you're here by chance, you're not created, you're not designed, and, and you're a problem. You're a problem with the environment, and your children will be even more of a problem, so don't have them. And you wonder why everybody has these huge mental crises. It's because they, they don't, you're not taught the right thing. And the Bible says you're created in the image of God. And because you're created in the image of God, you've been given dominion over his creation. And you've been given dominion over his creation, you have to be fruitful and multiply, and you have that command along with them. And so chapter 2 gets in the further explanation of, <coughs> of creation. So uh, verses 1 through 3 uh, talks about the, the seventh day. And then verse 4, it kind of gives a synopsis. First verse 4 through 6 uh, gave a synopsis of, of, of days 1 through 5. And so then starting at verse 7 through the end of the chapter, you get a, a, re, a more of an explanation of day 6. That's what Genesis chapter 2 is all about. And so <coughs> starting in verse 7, um, and it says, and, and the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed in him in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You see, God made man different than he made everybody else, everything else. He formed creatures out of the dust of the ground and, and let them go their way and put life in them and let them go their way. But then man, he said, you know what? This is my crowning jewel. I'm going to do something different. So he got down personally. I believe you could see the hands of hands of God forming forming man in his image and his likeness and then breathing into him a living soul, unlike he had done anything else. And it's such an amazing picture of the detail and the intricate work that went into designing humans and how they are and how they operate. And, and, and the best scientists, they haven't quite figured it out. They can figure out some of the things, but they won't admit to you they don't have it all figured out, how the brain connects to the physical body and how, you, how your inner man connects to, to who you are. And they're just now starting to tell you how much your, your mental health can affect your physical health and your physical health can affect your mental health and, and so on and so forth. They're just now locking into those things that the Bible has said for years and how everything's intertwined and, and even the best minds in this world just cannot quite grasp how, how man even comes to be. They can tell you how you're conceived and how you grow inside the womb, but they can't quite tell you how you become a, a, a conscious, how your consciousness is created and how your soul is created, unlike any other thing that comes forth. Uh, they might say they know, but they don't. They can't explain it because it's inexplainable. It's a divine thing that happens when God creates you inside the womb. And so <clears throat> God, God made something different than he created every other living creature. And then after he made man, so we're talking about man here, right? This is, this is going through day six. So God creates man. And then what does he do for man? Verses 8 through 17, if you're following along in Genesis chapter 2, read it with me. And it says, And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there put he the man who he had formed, and out of the ground <laughs> the Lord God, uh, out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden and the water <clears throat> to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. And the name of the first was Pison, and that is that it that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, and there is bedellum and onyx stone. And the second river is Gihon, and the same as that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hadakel, and that is <coughs> that is it which goeth toward the east east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for the day thou shalt eat thereof thou shalt surely die. And so this is what God did. See, God created man and God gave him a garden, gave him a job, gave him a purpose. You see, every man that's ever been created, God created you, and God created you for a purpose. Now, your purpose is obviously Adam's to take care of the Garden of Eden, but you have your own garden to tend to in your life. And it may be a, a literal garden, you may be an agriculture, or it may be something completely different than that, but God has given you a life to tend to. And that's your purpose for life. See, that's another thing that's so far out. Uh, a, a, child, a boy will get into high school and, they, and he won't have a, a, a direction for his life to go. And guidance counselors and teachers look and say, oh, it's okay, you don't do not know what you're doing. Just go to college four years and blow 100000 of your dollars and maybe you'll figure it out by the end. Who knows? And, and that's pretty much what they tell them. Uh, but God says, you've got a purpose. You've got a garden to tend to. And so when you start teaching men to be a man, you say you've got a life to live, a life to, to get busy, do something. You may not know exactly what you want to do for the rest of your life, but get busy doing something now and something will prop up. See, that's what happened in my life. And like I said, I'm not very old. I've not lived a long time to have the wisdom that a lot of people have. But in my life, my dad made sure I was always busy. And I realized that my life in itself was a garden to tend to, and I had a, a job to do. And I never went any, from the time that I was old enough to work, this was way before I even graduated high school, I had a job to do. My parents created us a, a greenhouse business to work at. Then I graduated high school and started into college and started a part-time job because we had closed the greenhouses down because they had served their purpose and uh, worked a job and went full-time to college and then eventually finished my first leg of college and went full-time and then went back and was working full-time at work and then also going full-time to college and I always had something to build, something to tend to. And it's amazing how God is built off of that. And my life has, God has just guided me every step of the way, but I've always had a garden to tend to. And that garden has gotten bigger and more robust as I've went along in life. And so there's a garden to tend to is the, the second point. <clears throat> and then the third point is found in verses 18 through 25. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And I'll make him a help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. <clears throat> and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and said thereof and the, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the <clears throat> brought her unto the man and Adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh and they were both naked the man and his wife and were not ashamed and so the last point that God said is it's not good for man to be alone. And so in the grand scheme of life, so God's created you by design for a purpose in his expressed image and breathing you a breath of life, unlike he's done every other creature. He's given you a garden to tend to. And the last thing is he's, he, it's not good for you to be alone. He's given you a help me. Every, every man needs a woman to make his life what God wants it to be. To be fruitful, obviously. To be fruitful and multiply. You cannot have children unless you're married to a wife, a woman. And uh, <clears throat> and so every man needs a wife. But here's the interesting thing about the woman and the reason why all this other crazy transgender movement and, and, and homosexual movement doesn't work. You see, God, man was created out of the dust of the ground and God breathed in him the, left, <laughs> God breathed in him the breath of life. But woman he did something a little different with. You see, the woman was the only thing not in the whole creation here that wasn't made forth out of the ground or, or the water. Uh, in this whole entire thing of creation we just went through, God brought the fowl and the fish out of the water, and then he brought the, the living creatures out of the ground, and then he formed man out of the dust of the ground, but he did something different with a woman that he didn't do with anything else. He took Adam's rib and formed a woman out of that. And the point of this is, is there's nothing on this planet that can take place of the woman's role in a man's life. And vice versa, there's nothing that can take place in a, in a woman's life of the man in the woman's life. God created one for the other and actually created the, man, the woman for the man. And so the woman was formed out of man. It was something that's uh, there. And so these men, even the ones that try to stay single, they try to fill this gap with making money or being in some kind of career and, and doing something like that. And they're always missing something because there's a part of them that has to be filled with a, with a wife, with a woman. 
And she's part of the man and he needs her to be whole again. You understand? And so uh, there's a leaving cleave and one flesh there that is required for you to become who God wants you to be in fulfilling your purpose in life. And so that's it for the second lesson on showing myself a man that's taking a little longer than I thought. It's about 30 minutes or so. But uh, uh, the point is, is God's created man in his image and given a purpose to man and also given man a woman to make his life full of meaning and to complete that purpose and to fill his cause, which is to be fruitful and multiply. And these are the things that are not being taught uh, to, to men, even inside churches. Uh, churches have really dropped the ball on this as well, and that was the point of last week's lesson is the churches dropped the ball. They're obviously not teaching this in school. They're not teaching this other words, other wells, anywhere else, but also churches aren't teaching this. And, the, and, and it's things that need to be taught that men have a, a reason and a drive and a purpose, and you need to be seeking that actively, not just sitting around on your hands wondering what the next thing is. Get up and do something. God gave you a purpose. God gave you a garden to tend to, and God gave you a woman that he's going to bring you. And, uh, and so that's it for the lesson. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you all next week.